Hey, I'm Zach. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. I hope that it encourages you. I hope it challenges you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's Word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And if you don't, we'd love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore, whether that's coming to one of our Sunday gatherings or coming to one of our Restore groups. Either way, we would love to see you. You can get more information about that on our website at RestoreAustin.org. And I hope you enjoyed this week's video. Today, um, well, if you're a Christian here this morning, something has happened to you. Something has happened to you that changed you forever. And I don't know when it happened. It might have been um, when you were a kid. Maybe you were kneeling beside your bed one night with your mom and your dad, and, and you prayed this prayer and you asked Jesus to come into your heart. Maybe you walked down an aisle at a church, or maybe you were at a summer camp, or a, a vacation Bible school, or something like that, and they had this great speaker that was up there talking about Jesus and sharing the hope that we have in Him, and then they gave something like an altar call or something, and they asked for anybody that wanted to accept Jesus to come down the aisle, and you walked down the aisle that day. Maybe you were just listening to a friend or a loved one share about how much they love Jesus, who He is in their life, and you thought, yeah, like to experience that. You might have even been just alone, reading the Bible, praying, and you felt this overwhelming presence of God around you, and you knew that he was worth trusting. Whenever and however it happened, that moment when you said yes to Jesus, that moment when you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. He transformed you that day, and he continues to transform you from the inside out. And I think one of the coolest things about being a Christian, one of the coolest things about that transformation that doesn't often get talked about is that that transformation is not just limited to you. If you'll let him, Jesus, through you will overflow that transformation out of you and share his grace and hope and love with your friends, your family, your coworkers, your loved ones, everyone around you. Jesus will show his love and his grace to the world through you. Today we're starting this new series, and I'm really, really excited about it. It's called Commission, and it's a look at what it really means to live our lives on mission, a look at what it means to see this transformation that's taking place in us overflow out and start interacting with people in our lives. So for the next six weeks, we're going to interview six different Restore family members about how they live life on mission, how they try to allow this transformation to overflow out of them, what challenges are associated with it, how it's hard, successes that they've seen, failures that they've walked through. And we'll also give you something new each week, something to, to kind of incorporate into your life, something to try out, something to bless somebody else with or or ways to really let that transformation go out, ways to live life on mission. Because the incredible thing is that this is God's whole plan. This is God's grand idea for sharing his hope and love with the world. He's doing it through us. He wants people to know that they're forgiven and loved because of Jesus, that Christ's sacrifice on the cross has brought reconciliation between God and humanity and his great plan of sharing this good news with the world is to do it through us. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, don't miss this last part, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's his plan. That's his mission, and we get to be a part of it. Him sharing his grace, hope, and love with the world, the good news of his son Jesus Christ happens through us. How beautiful is that? So, what is Jesus sharing his grace, hope, and love with the world through us look like? 
How does it look? What does it mean? How does it express itself kind of in normal, everyday life? Well, sharing our faith with others is often called evangelism. Right? You may have heard that term before. You may have been in church and heard that or even experienced some evangelism training or something like that. But when I say the word evangelist, what comes into your mind? Just think about what comes into your mind when I say the word evangelist. What do you picture? Well, we don't have time to go person by person through all of this. So I did the next best thing, and I typed it into Google Images. <laughs> and this is what came up. These are the first two results when I typed evangelist into Google Images. This, this young boy going out to the world and evangelizing. And then you have this older guy on the right holding his Bible and this sign that says, we're right. And there's two more I want to show. You have the guy over here on the right who is kind of pointing an accusatory finger at the world. He's got his Bible. He doesn't have the sign that says we're right, but basically that's what he's saying, right? We're right. I know. I'm going to tell you how to do this. And then on the left there, you've got a picture of Billy Graham. Why don't you have heard of Billy Graham, one of the great preachers of all time, traveled around the world and did these massive evangelism conferences. And this is one of the ones in his younger days speaking to tens of thousands of people. I think that that is a fairly common representation of what comes into our mind when we think about the word evangelist. We either think somebody on a street corner with a sign yelling at people, you know, with a megaphone or a sandwich board saying the world is about to end, you're all going to hell. Or we think about a preacher in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people saying, you know, giving this beautiful, eloquent speech and a grand invitation. And I think for the most part, neither one of us are... None of us want to do either one of those things or maybe are not capable of doing either one of those things. Most of us don't want to be on street corners yelling at people. Most of us don't have the ability to, or experience or knowledge or ability to just go out and speak to tens of thousands of people and have them come forward. So my goal in this series is not to make an evangelist out of it. I don't think that's God's goal either. I think that some people have special gifts to be able to debate deep theological truths or to share Christ on stage in front of thousands of people, but most of us simply were not created that way. And so the problem comes when we're supposed to share our faith. In fact, according to the most recent survey about evangelism, we're sort of like 75% or 80% of Christians mark that I think that I'm supposed to share my faith. It was 80%. 80% of Christians said, I think I'm supposed to share my faith. 75% of them on the next question said, I never do. And I think the biggest reason is because when we think of evangelists, this is what comes into our mind. We think of evangelism, we think of sharing our faith, we think of street corners, and we think of big crowds. And neither of those really appeal very much to us. We simply weren't created that way. So instead of trying to make you evangelists through this series, my goal is pretty simple. I have two of them. The first one is to encourage and equip you to live a questionable life. Encourage and equip you to live a questionable life. I'll explain more about that in a second. And the second one is to prepare you to answer the questions that come from it. Pretty simple. Live a questionable life, answer the questions that come from it. So the next question is, what is a questionable life? Well, I think the very best example comes from the very first Christians in the very first church right after Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave. So these women and men lived in such a questionable, countercultural type of way that the people around them couldn't help but ask, why are you doing this? Why are you living this way? What has happened to you to make you act this way? Michael Frost, in his book, Surprise the World, describes these kind of Christians. He says... These ordinary believers devoted themselves to sacrificial acts of kindness. They loved their enemies and forgave their persecutors. They cared for the poor and fed the hungry. In the brutality of life under Roman rule, they were the most stunningly different people anyone had ever seen. And remember what Roman life, Roman rule was really like. These were men and women that were being literally jailed and murdered for what they believed. In a situation like that, in a society like that, they were still loving people, caring for people. He goes on to say, they not only fed the poor, they welcomed all comers. Regardless of socioeconomic status, the noblemen embraced the slave. Moreover, 
Christians opened their fellowship to anyone, irrespective of ethnicity. They promoted social relations between the sexes and within families. Listen to this last line. They were literally the most surprising alternative society, and their conduct raised an insatiable curiosity among the average Roman. So that's what it looked like. That's what questionable living looked like in the first century. So what does it look like for us today? And I think the simple answer to that question in 2016 in America, in Austin, in the culture that we live in, living a questionable life just looks different from the culture that we live in. So the question you ask yourself is, what does culture look like? And I think right now, culture looks a lot like spewing hate about people that you disagree with. So what does living counterculture look like? It's speaking love instead. Culture looks like isolating yourself and your family from anything that might disrupt your lives, creating a wall, making sure that nothing can get in. So countercultural living is welcoming strangers instead. Maybe that's adoption, foster care, just creating a safe place for people to come into your home. Our society looks like putting ourselves first. Very simply, countercultural means putting others first. Our society saves up our money for new cars and new houses and new stuff, and we want to accumulate and we want to have the best and the biggest and the nicest. So countercultural, a questionable life looks like giving money away. It's like helping people who are in need instead of just spending stuff on ourselves. Our culture, we spend our free time doing things that benefit us. We hang out with people we like. We go to concerts. We go to movies. We go to dinner. Maybe volunteering instead. Maybe taking a little bit of time out of our everyday schedule and going and helping someone who's a little bit less fortunate would be questionable. Putting up a front in real life or on social media, making everybody think that you look a certain way, that you're act a certain way that you're okay when maybe you really aren't. So questionable living looks like just being real and being open and authentic with people. And when people ask you how you're doing, you legitimately answer that question. And when you ask somebody how they're doing, you don't just wait for the great. You listen to them. You ask them their story. You get to know them. As simple as that is, that's countercultural. That's a questionable living. Think about it, you walked into your favorite coffee shop or your favorite bar and you ordered a drink and you asked the person serving you, you say, how's your day going? And they're like, great. And you're like, no, really, tell me how, how it's been. How's your shift been? What's life like? How countercultural, how questionable would that be? The, the face that you would get from people, I think, would be one of disbelief that somebody might legitimately care how they're doing. That's questionable life in our society. And these aren't even things that you have to go way out of your way to do. My encouragement is to make them a part of the everyday rhythms in your life. Right? 99% of you, of us, are already on social media. Right? I see you. We're friends. I see what you post. We're already on social media. So maybe instead of using social media to argue with people, to put other people down, to just share our opinions all the time, maybe instead we just spend a little bit of time using it to build somebody up to speak love into people's lives, to encourage others. You eat every single day. I eat multiple times a day. I don't know about you. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> instead of just doing it alone or instead of just doing it with your family or with people that you like to eat with or eat with all the time, invite somebody that you might not know that well to have a meal with you. Invite a neighbor, a friend, a coworker to go out, listen to them, hear their stories, eat with them. You already do that. Just invite somebody else along. You come across people that are lonely at work or in your neighborhood every day. Invite them over to your house. Invite them out for coffee. You drive by people who are hungry and hurting every single day on street corners all over the city. Maybe if the spirit prompts you, instead of just driving by and you roll down the window and you give them a few dollars or you go buy them some food. Or you make little packs and they've got all these different supplies and socks and granola bars and all these things and you keep them in your car so that whenever you run across somebody like that you can roll down your window and you can hand them out. That's questionable. That's countercultural. That's different than the 99% of people that just drive by those people who are asking who are hurting who need help. 
When you allow Jesus to work like this through you, people are going to ask you questions. They are. They're going to ask you why you do this. They're going to ask you what prompts you to live this way. They're going to wonder why you have peace in the middle of the storms of life. They're going to wonder why you love people who are mean to you, why you roll down your window for the homeless person instead of just driving by them. They're going to ask you these questions. This is highly questionable behavior. And when those questions come, we should be ready. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I think this is where so many of us get tripped up. So I think we might be thinking, thinking to ourselves, I, I can live a questionable life. I, I, can, I can give some money to homeless people. I can invite other people to eat. I can be nicer on Facebook. We can all be nicer on Facebook. I can do some of those things, but when the questions come, I don't know how to answer them. I don't know my Bible backwards and forwards. I can't walk through Romans with somebody or share the plan of salvation. I don't carry around little tracks that I can hand out to people and walk through. I, I don't know how to do that. And it can be overwhelming. But that's not what God is asking you to do. Look at that verse again. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. It doesn't say always be prepared to walk somebody through the verses in Scripture that explain salvation. It doesn't say always be prepared to answer every theological question that somebody has. It says always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. And the answer to that is pretty simple. It's Jesus. He's the reason that we have hope. He's the reason, he's the answer to the questions that arise from living a questionable life. When people ask you why you live a certain way, you just say because of Jesus, and then you tell them your story. You don't have to know a bunch of scripture. You don't have to know all the answers to the tough questions about God. Say because of Jesus and you tell him your story. Think about it like this. If you're a Christian, you have a relationship with Jesus, right? We talk about that a lot. We talk about the difference between religion and relationship. That religion just requires a bunch of stuff where you got to act a certain way in order to make God pleased with you. But relationship with Jesus is different. Relationship with Jesus means that you already have everything that you need in Christ. He's given it all to you, regardless of who you are or what you've done. If you've asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, he's come in and he's saved you and he loves you and he's in a relationship with you and there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more or any less. So if you're a Christian, you're already in this relationship with Jesus and just like any other relationship in your life, you and Jesus have a story, right? You have a story about your relationship. How did you first meet? What's he like? Has, how has life been different since you met him? Just like any other relationship that you're in, you and Jesus have a story. So just share you and Jesus' story. It's that simple. You live life in a questionable way, and when the questions come and they ask you, why do you live this way? You say, it's because this guy named Jesus, let me tell you our story. It is that simple. You don't have to be on street corners with signs yelling at people. You don't have to be in front of tens of thousands sharing the Bible and going through the gospel and asking people to come down and pray to receive Christ. You just live in a little bit questionable way and then share your story, you and Jesus' story, when somebody asks you about it. Living on a mission isn't complicated, but it's tough. It's not easy. It's not easy to live a questionable life. It's not easy to be countercultural when culture is that way for a reason. It's easier to fit in. It's easier not to stand out. It's easier not to worry about what other people think. It's easier to not have authentic, real storytelling conversations with people. It's easier to just kind of be isolated and live in our own little bubble and not talk to people and just be around the people that we like and not roll down our window for that homeless man or woman not give money away when we really have been saving for that new car. It's easier to do that. So over the next six weeks, we're going to dialogue with some people who come from all different places, from all different backgrounds. They have all different kinds of experiences. They have all different kinds of vocations. But they've got one thing in common, and that's that try them right there. They're trying to allow Jesus to live this missional life through them. They're trying to allow him to lead their behavior to be questionable to the world 
around them. And our hope is that as you listen to these men and women share their stories, that God stirs in your heart. I pray that he alerts you to the fact that you can live a questionable life too. And then he brings to mind different ways for you to do so as we walk through these next few weeks. I hope this goes without saying, but these people aren't perfect, right? They're just like me and you. They mess up every single day. They fall short every single day. There are plenty of times when the Spirit's leading them to do something a little bit more questionable and they decide not to do it. But they're trying. They're moving forward. They're asking Jesus to live this questionable life through them. They're trying to work on what it means to be surrendered and allow the Holy Spirit to lead. And so I want to hear some of their stories. So this first interview is going to be with Laura Ramos. So as she gets up and comes up here, I want you to give her a round of applause. our connection team. So the connection center I mentioned earlier, after the gathering ends, if you go back there, you'll probably meet Laura and her husband Nick and some of our other volunteers. Laura and Nick and their family have been a part of Restore's family um, like for a year and a half now, since way, way, since before, way before we launched, even back in February. Um, Laura and Nick have become really great friends of ours, and I'm super exci excited for you to hear some of her story today. So, Laura. You can clap again, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. I want to start off, just kind of give us the, the three-minute version of the story of your life. Catch, up, catch us up to where you are today. Okay, so um, my name's Laura. I'm from Austin, and I am the oldest uh, daughter. I have five younger sisters, and um, I grew up here in Austin. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was seven years old, so we moved to San Antonio. So I actually went to high school there. Um, I came back to uh, UT, and I graduated in 2005 with a degree in nutrition. So um, I became a dietitian quickly after, and that led me to San Angelo, Texas, where I met um, my handsome husband, right? there. Uh, that was probably the best thing about living in that town. Um, <laughs> so we got married in San Antonio and I became a stepmom to Nicholas who's uh, now 19. Uh, so <clears throat> being a stepmom I knew that um, the three of us needed to spend more time together and at the time Nicholas was living in Plano. So we moved to Plano to live um, with him and spend middle school and high school with him and in 2011 I had my daughter Naya who's four, she'll be five next month, and my son Bear, Alexander, and he's two. Awesome. And then um, a year and a half ago, we moved to Austin from the Plano area, and now we're just ecstatic to be in Austin because it's the best city on earth. No doubt. And we love it. We love being closer to family and just being here. It's just a great city. Awesome. Well, we love yeah. having you here. Um, how did you make the decision kind of for <clears throat> your career path or life path? Okay, so I knew I wanted to go to UT. It was like my dream school. I just, um, having family from here, I knew I wanted to go there. And um, when I started, I actually said that I was a biology major because I didn't want people to know that I was really undeclared. <laughs> so I talked to a lot of different friends and just wanted to find out what their passion was. And I decided it for a degree in nutrition and I thought that I could combine food and my love for people um, in, that, in that career path. So I became a dietitian. And, and most of where my life has led has been family circumstances and life circumstances. So um, I was a diet. I've, I've been a dietitian for 11 years. Um, but when I was eight months pregnant with my daughter, I was actually laid off from my job, and I was doing consulting in Plano. And so it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I really wasn't happy where I was at. I didn't feel like in my particular job I was able to help people. And having a baby kind of makes you want to be more intentional with what you're doing and what your days are. And so luckily, um, my husband was able to provide for us financially. And so I was able to stay at home um, with my kids. And I later on started working part time um, as a dietitian. And then I also started Stella and Dot, which I've done for about three and a half years. And that's just a jewelry company that um, I sell jewelry and get to meet all these awesome women and just connect with other people. And so now that's, um, you know, my, my main thing is just being at home with my kids and doing that on the side. And so that's where God's led me. Awesome. Um, 
So we talked about this idea of, of rhythms and rhythms that already exist in our life. And so what are some of the rhythms that are already existing in your life? Okay, so we have a pretty set schedule, you know, Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, my two little ones go to school, and so that really allows me to have time to work, run errands, um, just do all the things I need to do. I also try to make a point to spend time with people, so, you know, last week I went to yoga with one of my friends who's here, and, you know, we got to, like, just spend time together, and so I try to try to make a point to do something like that, um, just my everyday week. I'm in a, an organization called Moms of Preschoolers, or MOPS, and so we do that every other Friday, and um, the other days during the week, we're, you know, going to story time or doing play dates and going to all the cool places around Austin. Sunday mornings, we're here, and I lead the connection team, so um, I spend a few hours every Sunday morning here at church, um, and then Monday night is probably one of my best nights of the week because um, I have my Restore group come over to our house and my husband and I lead a small group and it's a lot of fun and we have a, we have a great time doing that. Awesome. So. Okay, so we talked about this idea of living a questionable life and how that changes the rhythms. And so how have some of those everyday rhythms become questionable in your life? Well, I think that, you know, f social media you're talking about, it definitely... Um, it kind of makes people want to put on a front and just, you know, show the good stuff. And I think that if you've met me, then you've seen that I have so many mistakes and I'm not a perfect person. And I really try to be real with people. And so uh, when we have um, our restore group, for example, you know, it's a place where um, we are completely vulnerable and unmasked. And uh, we kind of try to set the tone for that type of vulnerability so that we can have real relationships with the people that are coming over to our home. And um, I don't think that everyone wants to have people over at their house and, <laughs> you know, wants to provide child care so that people can get together and cook. And I feel like God's put that in my heart to cook and serve. And um, so I love doing that. I probably invite people to so many things. Um, so I think people will probably question why I want to feed so many people <laughs> and have so many parties and things like that. And then just, you know, I think people ask you two things. And, and I, I think that what I've noticed is that people kind of hesitate. They don't necessarily want to really engage. And I really want to engage with my neighbors. Um, I know most of my neighbors and I have eaten with uh, at least half the street along with my family. And so just being, being there for them and being real. Um, also just with other women, because I'm around a lot of women, and I love being able to uh, compliment them, whether it's um, on social media or just in person. It just lights up their, you know, their face. I think, I think unfortunately, husbands can tell a wife that they look beautiful, but when another woman does that, it just really does something, so. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> um, so what are some of the struggles with living a questionable life? How does it get hard sometimes? I think that it's hard to be yourself and let people know that you don't have it all together and that you're not a perfect mom or a perfect wife. Um, so sometimes that, that's going to be hard. I, I, if it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't be able to do that at all. Um, it's also hard to make time for people. Um, having two small kids, you know, you really have to be selective with what you're doing and where you're spending your time. And I think I was sharing with Zach that, you know, last week was a perfect example, you know, just getting uh, little kids to church and, um, and you know, having, whether it's the house clean or just something ready for people to come over. Uh, last week, my son was walking around the church in a pull-up and rain boots, so I don't know if anybody else <laughs> saw that. But, you know, that's like the messy life. And so it is, it is difficult to do things when you have small kids, but my husband and I both have a passion for making time for other people, and so you kind of get over that. Um, yeah. And it's awesome. fine, and people laugh, and you know, it's okay, because uh, I'm not the only you know, person that you know, has had those kind of moments, um, but you've probably seen my kids here without shoes, or without clothes, or you know, all those type of things. So. Well, I love that, because it's just, that's real life, you know? I yeah. mean, we're not perfect, we don't have it all together, and I think when we pull back, you know, you said unmasked earlier, and I love that term, like when we take the masks off and we show people authentically who we really are, that gives them permission to show who they really are too, and I think it allows you to enter into these beautiful relationships and life-giving relationships with people. Um, okay, so that was kind of the hard struggle part. Where have you seen some cool stories or some successes in living a life a little bit questionably? Um, well, like I said, I feel like I've seen, uh, when I look at 
before trying to be intentional with the people around me, I didn't necessarily know, you know, my neighbors or um, I would just kind of miss certain things. And I can say that I know pretty well, you know, my neighbors on each side of me and the people around me and my restore group, you know, I feel like we're growing together and very much connected. Um, you know, just embracing new things like new babies being born and we just had a new baby in our life group. So, you know, just being able to like, you know, experience that all together as a family, that's been amazing. Um, just, uh, it's just, it's just wonderful to be able to have someone be real to you and then you have that back. So I definitely feel like I have uh, people that are in my corner when things have gone hard. And I would say, you know, this last year has been really challenging for my family and I. Um, at the beginning of the year, I just met Zach and Matt and a couple of other people here uh, for about a couple months and then um, I uh, lost my great grandmother and that was really, really hard. And so to have, um, I think when you are loving to other people, they want to love you right back. And I mean, this guy's a great guy and he really means it when he'll take you out for coffee. But just, you know, being there and like helping with different things that we needed and serving um, my family, that was, that was love and that was Christ. And I'm so thankful for that. And I think that's what Restore is all about, is just really being there for each other and being real. And I think that people don't, um, don't expect that from ch from church. You know, you think it's just something that you do on Sunday, but it's really something that we do every day, loving each other and being there for each other. Yeah, that's really, really beautifully put. Um, so that kind of leads into this next question of why do this? What is your motivation to live a questionable life? Um, my motivation is Christ and me. I um, can't help but share the good news and share him. Um, if, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to go through the struggles that I go through in my marriage and in my family and just the, the hard stuff in life. And I want people to have that hope that things will be okay. Yeah, so. yeah and I mean, that's a beautiful picture of what we were talking about at the beginning of this idea of transformation happening inside of you and then overflowing out into the world around you. It's because of, it's not something we have to manufacture. It's not something that we have to take from somewhere else. It's something that's happening inside of us. And we're just allowing it to overflow to the people around us. And it's beautiful when that happens. Okay, last question. How does Restore help you better live a commissioned life? Um, well, I definitely feel like I've grown so much here at this church. Our values, you know, of living in authenticity, grace, and um, having diversity, all of those, those values kind of spell things out easy. So it allows me to um, not be afraid to share my faith because I don't know everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I go, and so it allows me to do that and to be open and have that support back. I don't know that my husband and I have been as real with people as we have here, and so it's just an awesome place, and it's very freeing. Um, but also just, you know, like our partnerships, being able to go and find things that we can do, things that are already happening in our city. And I don't think I would know that if it wasn't for the church. So. Awesome. Well, um, let me pray for you, and then uh, we're going to clap you off the stage because you did an excellent, excellent job. All right, thanks. Um, God, thank you so much for Laura and for Nick and for their family, for all that they mean to our church, for all that they mean to your kingdom, for the way that, God, they just open up their lives and love people unapologetically, without qualification, just like your son Jesus did. And I pray that you continue to just have your hand on them, to lead them, to guide them. And that as they live this questionable life and answer the questions that come from it, God, they would experience that full, abundant, beautiful life that you talk about so much in Scripture. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord. You're awesome. So I alluded to this earlier, but... The question I think that comes to our mind so often is, does living a questionable life mean going out and trying to do a bunch of really good things and then just hoping that God blesses it? You know, trying to every day, just, you know, as soon as we, you know, before we get up early before work and we go feed the homeless and then after work we go and we volunteer somewhere and we give all of our money away and then we just pray and be like, God, please do something with this. Please bless this. 
Can we do it all in our own power? I, I think the answer is no. I don't think that's what it actually looks like. And I think scripture backs me up. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's prepared them. We just walk in them. That's so beautiful. It's so freeing. We don't have to spend all of our time preparing these good works, trying to figure out all of the things that we're supposed to be doing, and then just saying, God, would you bless some of these things? No, just like Laura said, it's the things that we're already doing. It's the things that he's already prepared beforehand. We just say, God, I'm available to you, and I'm going to walk in them. And I absolutely loved hearing about the ways that Laura and Nick and their family are walking in them. How she's allowing herself to be used in her everyday rhythms by God. Inviting people into her life who need community. Providing childcare so that other adults can have adult time with each other. Complimenting people, loving people, speaking beauty and care and truth into other people's lives. Opening their home every single week so that people can have a safe place to be open and vulnerable and authentic with each other. These are highly questionable things. And I know, like she said, because she's doing those things, she's being asked questions. Why do you act this way? Why do you live this way? And she answers them just the way she answered us. It's because of Jesus. It's because of Christ in me. What he's doing in my life, this is simply an overflow of all the things that he does for me, the way he loves me, the way he lavishes his grace upon me, the hope that I have in him, the peace that I have in the midst of hard times because of him. This is just an overflow of that. I really think, I really think that this series has the potential to change the way we see our everyday rhythms of life and honestly change the way we live our lives. Because we believe so strongly in this message, because truly it, this is God's great plan for sharing his good news with the world, we want to give each of you the book that I read from earlier today. So this book is just called Surprise the World by Michael Frost. And it's really this beautiful picture and representation of what it means to walk this commissioned life out, to live a questionable life. And so as we finish up, we're going to sing a song here at the end, but as you walk out, there'll be just a big table full of all of these books on your left. And so please grab one. If somebody that you know wasn't here and they're going to be here next week or in the coming weeks, you can grab a couple and take it to them. We'll have them every week, though. They'll be out there and available to you. The book looks at five different rhythms in every person's life and talks about how to allow Jesus to share his grace and hope and love through these rhythms. So as we walk through this series over the next five weeks, we'll spend a point of time interviewing someone each week. And then we'll also spend part of our time looking at one of these rhythms each week. So feel free to read ahead or check it out. But I really think this has the potential to be a beautiful, life-changing series for us and to make us realize we don't have to live a life of an evangelist, meaning that we're on the street corners with signs or we're in front of tens of thousands of people sharing and giving altar calls. We just simply live a questionable life and we have answers ready when the questions inevitably come. I'm so, so excited to begin this awesome, awesome adventure with you. So right now the band is going to come back up and we're going to close this morning by standing together and singing a song to mark the beginning of this journey that we're about to start on together. It's a song called Everything and Nothing Less, and it, it really paints this beautiful picture of what it looks like to surrender everything and nothing less to Jesus, to take our lives and put them in the hands of Christ and say, this is my offering to you, God. Do with it what you will. Allow the transformation that's happening in me to overflow out of me to the world around me. I want to live like Jesus lived because Jesus lives inside of me. So let's all stand together. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the beautiful message from your word. Thank you for the way that you truly are making your appeal through us and the beautiful fact that 
You prepared these things beforehand. You're not asking the world of us, God. You're not asking that we throw away all the places that you've placed us, all the things that you've given us. You're simply asking us to walk in the good works that you have prepared in advance for us. To begin to see our everyday rhythms, our everyday lives as opportunities to share your grace and hope and love with the world around us. God, thank you for Laura and Nick, for their family, for their story. Thank you for the ways that they're already doing this. I pray that as we step out in this journey together, as we begin this great adventure of living life commissioned by you, that we would experience you like never before. Because you're not just doing stuff in us anymore. Now you're doing things through us. I pray that would mark my life. I pray it would mark the life of every person in here. It's in Jesus.